Um, what kinds of geodata are they actually interested in, I guess is my starting point. Um, enhanced 911 addressing for GPS. Um, they turn out, amazingly enough, to be really interested in knowing where fire hydrants are. And it turns out they're also very interested in knowing the capacity of fire hydrants. For those of you who are urban dwellers, um, uh, it turns out that um, there are fire hydrants out there in the woods where there's no water system called dry hydrants, and they have their own properties. They'd like to know where ponds and streams are out there in the woods in case they're in a place where there are no dry hydrants. Um, they'd like to know where the landing zones for medevac are. It turns out those are prearranged entities out there in uh, rural America. They might have an actual interest in knowing what the hazardous material situation is in a place. And then there's another thing that they do in rural departments called pre-plan data, where new construction, they generally get detailed write-ups about the buildings that are being built. There have been a few alternatives for this over the years. There are data terminals, which are based on the classic uh, police department model, which are frequently consists of a ruggedized laptop, which is kind of an unwieldy thing in the field. There's a project at Princeton that uses an iPad as a basis for uh, fire department geodata. There's something, a commercial product called Active 911 that was originally focused really more on messaging than on geodata. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has something called Cameo FM, which is a tool for managing hazmat data, and that's basically a PC program for a laptop, which once again, it's kind of unwieldy in the field, but it's got some cool capabilities. And there's some other stuff kicking around. The data is generally already somewhere, and it's in the hands of county and city GIS departments typically, and it can be very unwieldy. I know one fire department in the Capital District of New York where I'm from that used to carry around the data on their fire hydrants in every single truck on a Rolodex. And um, Albany, New York, the uh, Waterworks Department gives the fire hydrant data to the fire department in the form of a big binder of paper maps. Once again, not something you necessarily want in the cab of your fire truck. And there are some problems you get in old cities. Um, the red arrows, oops, went one too far, there we go. The red arrows up there point to places in Albany that are Cortland Street, which is a street in four parts with no obvious way to get from one part to the next. The blue arrow points at a spot where you might think there would be a fifth part of Cortland Street, but there's not. And you might think this is a pathological case, but actually I have seen instances like this in every single city in the Capital District of New York, just a not completely hooked up street grid. There are things that have been done in OpenStreetMap. This is Open Fire Map, which was produced by a German mapper who is also a volunteer firefighter. It's kind of cool, but it's an online thing, so once again, you can get at it from a PC or a Windows box in your web browser. But once again, out in the field, um, not terribly accessible. And the other thing about it is that right now it's optimized for German operating practices. And one thing you'll find is that operating practices vary a lot. And the way we do things in the US is kind of different from the way they do things in Germany, from the way they do with them in the UK. So what I've been working on is a geodata assistant. The whole premise is to use something like, say, this uh, seven inch Android tablet here running OSM AND is the current iteration. And um, a plug-in to support emergency response is something that's probably going to be needed. And part of the premise is to pull in both OSM data and other data from elsewhere that may not be appropriate for OpenStreetMap. Because I think most of us agree we probably don't want to put hazmat data in OpenStreetMap. I think a lot of people think that may be the wrong thing to do. Another important premise here is that internet or cell access should not be a requirement. The tablet needs to be self-contained because as anybody who has ever been in the woods knows, you don't have cell service everywhere. The primary use case for this, at least initially, would be mutual aid. And the point here is that fire departments and engine companies that respond in their neighborhood are generally really pretty okay. 
but when they get into mutual aid situations where they've got to cross the line, then they start to get to be into a little bit of trouble, examples of things that can cause trouble. Addressing in large apartment complexes, how are you going to find uh, building uh, five when you have no idea what the structure of the apartment complex is? Um, they don't know a lot about the neighborhoods. The one-way streets can be a little bit baffling and confusing. The water systems are problems. There may be private water systems where you don't even have a clue what the capacity of a hydrant is. And uh, even if it's not a private water system, um, not everybody uh, codes their hydrants as to their actual capabilities. So it's like one red hydrant and the next red hydrant, how do you tell which the good one is? And then nowadays we have the situation of extreme mutual aid that's come up. New York City has had this happen twice in recent years. Both 9-11 and Hurricane Sandy, fire departments from all over the Northeast sent trucks to help out. There's local knowledge in a place like New York City and um, the only way that um, an assisting agency can get local knowledge is in a rather tedious process of showing up and trying to learn. So now these are the threatened fire hydrant photographs. Um, these two are dry barrel hydrants. Um, what dry barrel means is basically that there is no water in them except when they're actively in use. The valve is buried deep underground and this is just as true of fire hydrants as it is of icebergs. Is there's just as much below grade as there is above grade. These are typical modern hydrants. You see that there is one large diameter fitting called a steamer connection, which is for hooking up to the pumper, and there are two smaller diameter fittings called hose fittings. Hose fittings might be two or two and a half inches. Steamer connections could be four or four and a half inches. These are in two unique color schemes, and I am here to tell you that neither one of these color schemes means anything beyond somebody in the water department thought they looked good. This is a wet barrel hydrant. This is a Southern California thing. Um, basically, these are pressurized at all times, and um, this one, the color scheme means that somebody had something to do with UCLA. Um, so if you ever see a video from Los Angeles where some idiot has driven over a hydrant and there's a geyser of water off into the sky, that's because they use wet barrel hydrants in LA. That would never happen in the Northeast. So, do the color schemes ever mean anything? Yes, they do. This is a hydrant in Winnetskill, New York, which is painted in the American Waterworks Association scheme. Chrome yellow barrel for high vis, and the light blue indicates that it's a class AA hydrant, which can supply more than 1,500 gallons per minute. And for your information, more than 1,500 gallons per minute is really good. And the point to all of this is that we're mappers. I'm telling you how you can look at a hydrant and find things to map. <laughs> so the American Waterworks classification, you see we have four tiers. The AA down through the sea, where the sea is less than 500 gallons per minute. You see the colors of the caps, blue, green, yellow, and red. A firefighter who sees a red painted cap is very likely to go looking for a better hydrant. 500 gallons per minute is not much. And note that there is a specified flow value of 20 PSI. This is a US um, operating practice. For reasons that I don't clearly understand, the Germans want to record what's called a static or head pressure, which is typically five times or more the uh, 20 PSI number. And I don't quite know why they care about that, because when you're actually using the hydrant, you are never seeing the head pressure. So why do we care about capacity? Well, the obvious reason is that if you've got a big fire, you want a lot of capacity. But secondarily, Drawing down the pressure can drain the line, and if you drain the line, then you drain the water out of the households along the water main. And if you do that, then uh, the fire department's insurance company is going to be buying a whole bunch of new hot water heaters. And secondarily, there's a real serious risk with small mains that uh, if you spin up these pumpers, you can actually collapse a water main. 
And once you collapse the water main, then now you're talking about a whole string of dead hydrants and having to go on a search for ones you didn't kill. So continuing with the hydrant gallery, this is another variation on the color code. In Bethlehem, New York, they paint the uh, steamer cap green for a big main, orange for a medium main, and red for a little main. They don't always paint it that way. In Cohoes, New York, they put an aluminum ring around the steamer connection and paint it to indicate the capacity, which seems like a really good idea, except that um, if you have idiot painters in the waterworks department, I have seen any number of these where the painter came along and painted the whole thing to match after the fact. And these are two alternatives that indicate just how random things can get. These are both very old hydrants. The one on the left has got a pair of hose connections and no steamer connection, and the one on the right has a large steamer connection and no hose connections. The one on the right is actually quite a bit more useful because at, firefighters almost never actually use the hose connections anymore. They just hook a truck up and then they take the hoses to the, directly to the truck. I took this one uh, about two months ago because, um, you know, we have had a little bit of precipitation in the northeast this winter. And so when you start thinking about capacity of hydrants, and we talked about painting the hydrants to indicate a color code, well, when a hydrant is buried deep enough, you can't really tell what it is you're going to get. And a quote one firefighter that I put up there, if I have to dig one out of the snow, it better be a good one. But how would you know? And then there's the other parameter, which is that hydrants don't always work right. This hydrant here, and it's a little hard to see, but you see it's sticking out of the snow, and it says out of service on the tag around the steamer connection. Imagine if you dug down, and then you got to that tag. Of course, sometimes out of service is a little different. Um, on the left here, we have a fire department that had a big enough budget that they were able to buy a bunch of orange bags that say not in service. The other department had a much smaller budget, so that's a black plastic garbage bag and a roll of duct tape. Of course, there's also out of service, but it's a secret. Um, dirty little secret from New York City. Um, they had two whole separate hydrant systems running in parallel from 1905 to 1979. The short squat hydrants, which are called stubbies, were on the high pressure system. High pressure system was shut down in 1979, but it has taken them 35 years to remove over 6,000 hydrants from the city. So the short stubby hydrants have been sitting there, and they're still in the financial district with no water pressure, but you know, they can still write parking tickets, which some people think is the reason why they left them in place. <laughs> and I'll also point out in passing that whereas most people think hydrants should be high visibility, in New York City they paint them black. Which is amusing because, one, in theory, one of the ways that you can mark a hydrant out of service is to paint it black, but in New York City they all start out black. And this is local knowledge, and let's Remember extreme mutual aid. Lots of fire trucks went to New York City to help out both after Sandy and 9-11. I'm sure that all of the new firefighters in New York City are taught soon enough not to hook up to the stubbies. But what about all the guys from Albany, New York or from New Jersey coming in who don't know? How do they learn this about the hydrant system? Now, here's a little hydrant parked against the corner of the building, and you should immediately be suspicious because hydrants should never be installed next to buildings. But on top of that, this happens to be in front of a volunteer fire department headquarters in a part of New York that has no pressurized water system. So, we call this a lawn ornament. Because for some reason, rural fire departments frequently will stick a hydrant out in the lawn because they're a fire department and it doesn't do anything. And then I mentioned the dry hydrants. Here are two typical examples of dry hydrants. You drive around in the woods and if you're from a city you don't know this is what you're looking at. 
But these are basically pipes that disappear below the ground and enter a pond or a stream below the line that freezes so that they can pull up at any time of year and prime the pump and start drying water from the pond or the stream. Issues you get with dry hydrants that you don't see in pressurized systems. Seasonal issues, there may not be water that are part of the year. There may be weeds. And then there's another parameter that's important to firefighters called the lift is that you typically need to have a piece of pipe in the, in the truck to finish the connection needs to be X feet long and if you need 12 feet of lift at a dry hydrant and the truck's only got a 10 foot pipe, then that dry hydrant might as well not, well not be there for that truck. And that's a fire plug, a dry hydrant. It should be a dry barrel hydrant, but it's out in the middle of the woods. You would see this when the water source is actually above the hydrant and you need to keep the water out of the hydrant during the winter. So they just use the same piece of equipment. Another obscure fact, I bet none of you have ever actually gone and looked at the bolt heads on a hydrant before. The one on the left is square, the one on the right is pentagonal. You may occasionally see hex bolts, but you're more likely to see square, pentagonal, triangular. So, back to the project, now that I've characterized some of the things that you might need to include. This is what we can do today. This is OSM and on this tablet, and these are fire hydrants located in the map of Rensselaer, New York. So a firefighter who has this on their dashboard of their truck can immediately see where the nearby hydrants are today. On top of that, in environments where we have building footprints, you can have a view like this. Why does this interest firefighters? It interests firefighters in urban areas because now they can see what paths they can get to get access to the backsides of buildings. Turns out that urban firefighters really like this capability, which is why, you know, getting building footprints and addresses into OSM would be kind of really valuable in this scenario. The future evolution, and this, uh, I guess I have to call it a Photoshop job, although I didn't use Photoshop. Um, suppose we can color code the hydrants according to their capacity. Now we've got an interesting use case. I am using OSM AND to guide me to the site of a fire. As I drive down the road, it's showing me the capacity of the hydrants that I'm passing. And I can see when I am passing the last good hydrant before I go down the cul-de-sac. Now, instead of driving in, discovering that the hydrants are bad and driving out, I can stop and start laying the line from the last good hydrant because typically at the ends of the cul-de-sacs you're looking at hydrants on five inch diameter mains and they don't get any flow at all and you don't even want to crack those. So what I've been doing is working on tagging hydrants and trying to figure out what tagging should be. These are typical current tags. Um, fire hydrant type, you know, pillar, pond, underground, Pillar is something the Germans selected that's technically correct in the U.S., but little used. We would be more likely to want to say dry barrel and uh, wet barrel than pillar because pillar is uh, less information. And they chose to include pond as their way of describing a uh, dry hydrant, and I think that this is an inappropriate conflation of water source with the type of delivery system and I'm going to be proposing some tagging changes in response to that. Color, of course, well we know the hydrants have colors, but we've seen that they have more than one color, and then finally there is an existing diameter tag, which is exactly what we might want. Um, and also there's a pressure tag the Germans use, and because they actually do record that head pressure for reasons I don't get, but I would think we would not even use the pressure tag in American tagging. So I'm proposing adding a capacity tag, which could be gallons per minute or liters per minute. The American Water Works classes, um, we create a separate water source tag so that we can separate the uh, water source from the uh, delivery mechanism. 
And we need to talk about how we set capacity on streams, which is kind of, uh, it's not something you think about, but um, I do know the fire chief for Port Henry, New York, which is along Lake Champlain. And uh, what he pointed out to me is that, you know, he's got a huge lake right there, all kinds of water, and he cannot use a drop of it because there's a railroad track between the lake and everything else, and you can't throw a line over an operating railroad track. So the result is he's going out and measuring the capacity from all of the streams that are feeding into the lake. Some more tags. Um, color reflective is interesting. I just kind of threw it in because there were reflective strips on a lot of the hydrants, but I was kind of felt validated when I got here to DC. And I discovered that the way they apparently put capacity on hydrants is with brightly colored reflective stripes, because I've seen blue and yellow walking between here and the hotel. Which means I've got a reason to go take more pictures of fire hydrants. And then color cap and color bonnet I have added to represent the tops and the caps. And um, I showed you all of those pictures of out of service hydrants for a reason. I think that the hydrants need to go into OSM whether they're in service or not and then we need to explicitly mark them out of service. And this is a defensive exercise because I worry about mappers who are not knowledgeable adding hydrants that they don't realize are out of service. I think they have to be in the map and then marked correctly. Other properties to think about. Um, outlet sizes and threads, they're not all the same. Some of them are threaded, some are quick disconnects. Wrench sizes and types. Dry hydrant conditions, I kind of already went over that. Landing zones, we don't really have good tags for this sort of affair right now. They're not the same thing as heliports because typically it's a parking lot or a farmer's field where we have an agreement that it's going to be used. So we've got to work out how to tag these. Hazmat data, public record, but I think most people don't see it as in OSM. This is a reason why this project will probably end up providing a private database to contain these kinds of materials. What are the hazmat use cases? Well, you would like to know what's in that building that's on fire. You might like to know what's in the buildings next door to it. Capability in Cameo FM from the EPA to uh, compute plumes and figure out the distances that are at danger and what directions those are in. That is something that might be pretty easy to integrate into this in a plug-in. Is, you know, I think the firefighters at the scene probably would like to know where the plume is going to and what's in it. Potential for interaction of the plume with the GPS. Um, I was talking to the chief of the Schenectady New York Department. Schenectady Chemical goes up in a blaze of fire. There's a plume with a southern prevailing wind. That's actually going to block the three main roads that his help would come from under normal circumstances. You throw that into OSM and and mark these things inaccessible and now the GPS will automatically route your help around the plume. We need to think about policy on overriding one-way and turn restrictions. In New York State law, any emergency responder is allowed to completely ignore all one-way and all turn restrictions. Do we necessarily want to do that? No, in fact, they're very cautious about it, but the GPS should certainly allow us a way to set policy on whether or not the emergency responders can blow that off. And do we need to provide for different classes of emergency vehicles? A pumper is different from the chief's SUV, is different from an extensible ladder truck. They have different requirements for turn radius and space. In downtown Albany, they still use the good old fashioned hook and ladder truck because they can't get an extensible ladder truck down some of these streets. But with rear steer on a hook and ladder, they can manage it. So there's my contact info and um, I'm ready to take questions and I just want to mention that there is a bonus slide at the end of the credits here, so stick around. Do we have any questions? Yes. Okay. Yes. Hey, uh, I have a, actually three questions uh, if you have time. Um, I was curious, well, personally, I, I work uh, for a local government, and we map uh, swimming pools, private swimming pools, out of the areas beyond where the, the water goes. 
And I was wondering if you would advocate MAPPERS add to it, because the, uh, they have an agreement in the county that if anybody that has a, a private pool, the fire department's allowed to come in and pump the water out if there's a fire. For so, a project like this, absolutely. Okay. Um, and I was curious with that wet barrel, how, uh, if you open the, the one of the caps, pull the water just to shoot right out? Each of the caps has its own valve. If I go back to that picture, and I can show it to you after this, because it's the coffee break, you'll see that they have a valve on the back side, whereas the dry barrel they don't because okay. they operate the main valve at the bottom. By the way, this is actually from a old catalog, and you can this is the full dry barrel, and you can see the valve down at the main. Oh, that's that's how they keep them dry. There's also a drain back, so they will empty once you shut them off. Okay. The, the last thing you mentioned the wrench types uh, in Baltimore, we have a lot of these um, uh, like vandal resistant. Things where it's this little spinny cap and you like a special tool. Yeah. So I was wondering if you have any uh, thoughts to, to tag those, like because the, the they need the, the special unlocker tool. Yeah, I, I would classify that as part of wrench type, and I have not specified a wrench type tagging yet because I don't understand all the issues. Okay. So yeah, it's the kind of thing that you would include. Yes. Uh, so I think you presented a good uh, use case on the mutual aid. And it uh, sounds like you've actually talked to some of your local government officials as well. So post 9-11, most communities are risk averse to sharing their hydrant or water system information. Uh, so what suggestions do you have for the community to engage their local government officials if they want to go and start mapping hydrants and provide that information um, as a source? Well, it's just kind of a slow and tedious process. I think that um, there's a lot of risk aversion to right but I've seen that most of the has to do with um, they like the idea that they're scared of spending money on something to start out. Um, you know, the attitudes vary a lot, and there are local governments. Uh, right now, Elliot here, I haven't been formally introduced to, but I wrote his name that earlier, and I know who he is. Um, you know, that's government that's actually trying to get the data out there and help them. But then by comparison, in New York City, Colin spoke earlier, and he had a great talk about what they're doing, but I was talking to him earlier, and the department that maintains their hydrants is, doesn't even share information with New York City. They see other, other agencies in New York City as the enemy, apparently. So I think this is, this is the real war. The way I've been looking at it is that um, I am trying to work on getting this project forward in upstate New York and some Probably close to where I live, but I don't like to be a lot. And just trying to do a pilot for a small government, but I think that the data is going to become most easily available once I have a fire department saying, yes, we need you to create this data. Because I encountered this with the GIS department in my own county, or in the county, and it's just like, yeah, we don't have time to deal with this, so no. But as soon as there is a government party saying, yes, you have to deal with it, Yes, and we're going to be more likely to get data. So that's how I am going to take the fire department 